you might want to abstain from snacking during this episode, because we're about to stick a fork into something inherently unappetizing. I'll try to handle the topic tastefully, but it's an issue of delicacy. We're tucking into cannibalism, how history distorts it, how disturbingly natural it is, and how some people can get away with it today without breaking the law. Allow me to explain. Buzz, 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 buzz. Despite our barefaced repulsion towards the subject, society seems eerily obsessed with the idea of eating people. At least three common movie monsters, zombies, werewolves, and vampires, have similar man-eating traits. They start off as humans, spread their condition with a bite, and then feed off of living human flesh. And apparently, we love them all the more for it. Clearly we're obsessed with assigning mythical creatures cannibalistic urges, but the cannibal is no myth, at least not historically. Evidence such as smashed proto-man skulls with tool marks inside of the brain cavity are strong indicators that cannibalism has been around a lot longer than recorded history. This evidence has been found on every occupied continent and across many islands on the globe. Your distant, distant ancestors almost definitely ate other proto-people. Hey, this soup is pretty good! What's your secret? I discovered an old family recipe from my great-aunt Australopithecus. During the more recent Age of Discovery in the 14 and 1500s, stories of cannibalism were ridiculously common. However, there is good reason to doubt the prevalence of cannibals during this time period. Explorers were well known for their tall tales about cities of gold, fountains of youth, mermaids, giants, and everything in between. I imagine if they wrote down what actually happened during their journey, people would be a lot less interested. So how was your voyage? I spent several months in a small, dark, always shifting space, constantly throwing up. Oh, anything else? Nope! There's also the fact that in 1503, the Spanish crown ruled that only people in conquered lands that were violent cannibals could be enslaved. This undoubtedly led to countless people being unfairly painted as bloodthirsty in the interest of free labor. Historical accounts say that Spanish officials would land on an island, round up some natives, say, well, they certainly look like cannibals, don't they? Before signing an official document declaring it to be so. Sort of like how you can declare pizza to be a vegetable in order to stay on your diet. By the way, the word cannibal can be traced back to the word carib or caribe, the same word that the Spanish used to refer to the islands in what is now the Caribbean. A name that literally means a sea of cannibals. If you thought mislabeling Americans as Indians was bad, we also apparently mislabeled over a million square miles of ocean and islands as home to cannibals. Now that's what I call an exaggeration. Today, there are a very few remote locations where cannibalism might still be practiced. From 1957 to 1977, in Papua New Guinea, there was an epidemic of a neurological disorder called Kuru among the Foray people. Kuru is the name-dropping equivalent of mad cow disease, except in people, and one way to get it is to eat human brains. Mm. Mortuary cannibalism, or the eating of dead relatives out of respect, was blamed, and the practice, along with Kuru, has since disappeared. Some anthropologists report small populations of cannibals practicing into the 2000s, but today, virtually all regular acts of human cannibalism have stopped. But cannibalism still exists in a criminal capacity, categorized somewhere between a violent crime and a mental illness. Interestingly, in many countries, such as the United States, cannibalism is not actually against the law. However, in order to get to the point where you're eating a person, you probably have to break other laws, such as those against murder or grave robbery. There are many interesting cases of criminal cannibalism in recent years. I'll spare you the gory details, but if you're interested, you can check out some of the links in the description below. Beyond violent cannibalism, there's auto-cannibalism, or the eating of yourself. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. No one would actually do that, right? Oh no! This brings us to placentophagy, or the consumption of the human placenta, an organ that grows alongside the baby in the womb. This has somehow gained popularity in alternative health circles. Advocates claim that many mammals do it, and it's a great source of vitamin B6. Hey, you know what else is a good source of vitamin B6? Food. 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 Grains, nuts, bananas, they all contain it. There is no need to eat a placenta. Make no mistake, this is legal cannibalism. And then of course there's survival cannibalism, where you're forced to choose between eating people or starving. The famous examples of this being the Donner Party and that rugby team whose plane crashed into the Andes Mountains. I cannot even begin to imagine the psychological warfare of that kind of extreme hunger, and I find it hard to place blame on those who are in that sort of desperate situation. So why does cannibalism even exist? At the crux of it is, as usual, evolutionary strategy. Cannibalism exists in pretty much every corner of the animal kingdom. 
Species of fish, birds, reptiles, insects, and mammals have all been shown to exhibit a specific kind called heliocannibalism, in which you consume your own young offspring. Which at first glance seems like a poor way to proliferate the gene pool. We are officially the last two psychedelic sturgeon alive. We need to seriously consider swearing off of caviar. But it's so trendy! But, as a 2007 paper from the American Naturalist suggests, there are at least some advantages that can be gained. These potentially include a reduction in competition, an emergency source of food, and selectively cannibalizing lower quality offspring can lead to better future generations. Now here's a question I never thought I'd be asking. If cannibalism can be beneficial to a species, why and how did our ancestors give up on it? On the one hand, kuru and other diseases are dangerous, and we as humans invest a lot of care in our youngsters. This could point to a naturally evolved explanation for our repulsion. But on the other hand, it was still practiced very recently on the evolutionary timeline. Could our civilization, given dire enough times, be brought back to that point? Do children need to be taught that eating people is gross, or do they just kind of know that? Are placenta eating and movie monster fads indicative that we all still have a little bit of an inner purple people eater? What do you think? Are you having an existential crisis about how we're all made of meat? And has this episode spoiled your appetite? Let me know in the comments below. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Hit the like button and subscribe for more content. You'll be helping me out a ton. See you next time. I'm eating people, aren't I?